Well, hey, Rev City, friends and family, so good to be with you today, and I hope that the presence of God's filled your heart, filled your home. Listen, even in the midst of some challenging times that we're walking through as a nation, and as I watch some of the horrific things unfold recently, um, the brutal murder of George Floyd on the streets of Minneapolis, my heart was grieved. And I knew quickly that as a pastor and as a church that there was a response. There was a, there was a, a responsibility that we would have to speak into what happened to George Floyd, which really represents something that has happened so many times in so many places for too many years in ways that were not captured on camera and were not on display to see. And so I sought the Lord, and I believe that the Lord really began to just speak to me and show me and highlight to me the opportunity to gather some, some of my brothers, to gather some men of God, to come together and have a courageous conversation about race relations and to have a courageous conversation about the heart of God for reconciliation and restoration and what our part is as men and women of God. And by the way, women, the role of women in this conversation and their voices cannot be overstated, the importance of that. But, but, but thank you for your grace. In this situation, I just felt compelled to just call some of my brothers and just have a conversation brother to brother. And so I want to say thank you to these mighty men for being willing to come and be part of this important conversation to come and be part of this courageous conversation. And I want to just thank you in advance, and I want to invite you to speak freely and candidly and trust that the Lord would use our conversation today to do just what this conversation is intended to do, to bring a new and a deeper level of healing and freedom and restoration that is obviously desperately needed in our nation today. And so would you give me the privilege of just taking a moment to introduce these mighty men, my friends, my brothers in Christ, and and starting on the right here, my, my left, uh, Pastor Eddie Diaz serves as our executive pastor. He's a mighty man of God, a dear friend. Thank you, Pastor Eddie, for being a part of this today. And to Pastor Eddie's right, to my left here, Michael Criddle, a mighty man of God, an amazing friend in God's kingdom. And Michael, thank you for being willing to be here today and be part of this conversation. And next, Boniface Matuku, a mighty man of God and a dear friend in God, a prayer warrior on behalf of Rev City Church, this church family in the body of Christ at large, Boniface, thank you for being here and lending your voice and your leadership, your perspective to this conversation. Sitting right next to me, Steve Kiefer, a dear friend and a mighty man of God, a, a man whose family has become so near and dear to ours. And uh, thank you, Steve, for being willing to be here and speak courageously and being a part of this conversation. And, and to my right here, Jonathan Rainey, a dear friend, a mighty young man of God, a leader in this church and in our community. And thank you, Jonathan, for being willing to be here and be part of this conversation. And, and by the way, John is a, a head coach of the Bishop Seabury basketball team and had them on the brink of a state title before the tournament was shut down by the COVID pandemic. And John was recognized as the coach of the year in his classification. Come on, on the st statewide in Kansas, the coach of the year. Come on. We're proud of John Rainey and his family. You're also as amazing a basketball coach as you are, amazing man of God, amazing father and husband to your family. And Sitting next to Jonathan Rainey here, uh, Pastor Micah Barclay, another mighty young man of God, a leader in our church, leads our student ministries, leads our pastoral care. And so just so thankful for you guys being willing to be part of this conversation. Yeah, so guys, I just want to quickly, I just want to turn it over to y'all and ask you, what's the Lord doing? What's he speaking to your heart? One of the things the Lord put on my heart is that it was important that we would gather together and have a conversation that might be difficult to have. It might be easier to stay silent. And I would just want to encourage us that we don't have all the answers, but we know the one who does. And, you know, I, I, this conversation, um, there's a tendency to be intimidated by having these kind of conversations. But I want to encourage us to speak freely, and I want to thank you for having grace for us, that we might not say everything just the way that you would like for it to be said. But I think we can't allow our inability to say something perfectly in this moment with all the emotion that's associated with it to keep us from having the conversation. The people of God have got to start having these conversations, and the church has to be part of the solution. And we can't wait. We, you know, another thing that just came against me was, can we really make a difference? And the Lord just spoke to me, and he just said, you cannot allow the size of your Goliath to cause you or keep you from stepping onto the battlefield and just picking up the one stone or the five stones that you have access to and beginning to trust God for the results. And so that's our part is just to be faithful. And so I want to thank you guys once again for being a part of this conversation and just say, what's the Lord speaking to you? What's, as you've watched everything unfold and you've, you've seen what's, what's transpiring in our midst, 
What's going on in your heart? What's God speaking to you and through you? I guess, uh, you know, Pastor T, for me, um, you know, obviously watching the, the, the video that unfolded, um, it, was, it was anger. It, it, it was hurt. Um, you know, it's something that I personally have been affected by. Um, obviously not police brutality, but definitely uh, some racism. Um, you know, right here in Lawrence, uh, it's real in Kansas. It's real in the United States. Um, you know, it's not a hoax. It, it, it's real. And people face, uh, face it every single day. And um, so for me, you know, watching uh, the hurt and the pain that, that, that's going on, it, it's, it's almost like, you know, as you see these fires rage, uh, you know, that's kind of the rage that you feel inside, uh, knowing that here we are in 2020 and um, some of the same uh, issues are still going on and they're close to home, uh, a lot closer than probably what people think. Um, but you know, uh, we obviously need, uh, need, need God. We need the, we need the grace of God. And, um, you know, he, we, we, we've got to, we've got to get closer, but you know, the, the, the first thing I would say is that it's real. It is real. To answer your question for me, the challenging thing over the last couple of weeks has been the impact that I've seen this have on the family structure. So we look at racism, um, black versus white, white versus black, but it has its way of finding its way into families, into relationships, that when you look at those families and relationships on the surface, you would theorize that they have the same outlook, they have the same position, but the enemy is out to kill, steal, and to destroy. And he will use whatever means necessary to do that. So I hear what you're saying, and I can relate to, to that, and I empathize with that. For me, it's not only that, but it's also the impact that it's had within our family. It's about the story that one of my sons shared with me about a friend of his whose family members unfriended him on social media because of his stance. That's the work of the enemy. That's the work of the enemy. And it's taken on a new position of the murder that took place. It's taken another step. Now it's fractured a family that is many states removed from that. But that's the work of the enemy. He comes for no reason but to kill, steal, and destroy. Yeah, I, I, if I can dovetail off of that just for a minute. You know, it, you think of the story in, in Joshua in chapter 5, I think it's in verse 13 where it starts, and, and Joshua is getting ready to face his enemy. And as he's walking and, and preparing, he runs into the command of the Lord's army, pre-incarnate Jesus. And he says, are you with us? Or are you with the adversary? You know what I'm saying? It's like, is it, is it us that you're with or is it with them? And the response was, no. And it's like, he, then he realized who this was. He falls to the ground and, and, and the Lord says, take your sandals off because where you're standing now is holy ground. And it's that place where we can't look at it's me versus you, it's us versus them. It's like, I need to find myself in the place of Jesus on holy ground where then now things can get settled the right way. But when we, when we, when we give into the fire that's raging into us, not to deny the fire, that's a, that's a reality. But what we have to say in the midst of that, God help me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my sandals off, I'm gonna lay myself down and put myself in a position, God, what would, how do you want me to respond? So that I'm not falling into my reaction and I'm not falling, I'm not giving in to the, to the anger. I'm, I'm going to express my frustration, but I'm not going to give it. Because I saw that video, I probably watched it 10 times of George being murdered. And it, it, I got ang more angry and more angry and more angry to the point that I was like, I, I can't do anything with this. And so I said, God, I got to give this to you. You tell me how to respond. And it, it, what Pastor Thomas said is so true. Eddie, just watch and listen to what's being said. You know, the first time I was called the N-word, I was 13 years old. 
And um, it was right here in Lawrence. And, uh, you know, obviously we think of Lawrence as being a diverse community. And, uh, and it is. And there's many, 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 many great things about Lawrence, Kansas. It's my home. Um, but, you know, as I said, the reality is it, it, it's out there and it's closer than we think. And, uh, you know, to be able to, um, you know, have that conversation with my son, to be honest, I was thankful. I, 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 I thanked God for that opportunity and to uh, get him to understand and get him to realize that, you know, unfortunately, there's going to be people that hate you for no other reason than the color of your skin. But at the same time, we are uh, a chosen people. You know, God uh, loves us. He embraces each and every one of us. And he loves you. And, you know, we can t take all of our cares to him, uh, all of our concerns to him. Like I said, I had to do it at 13 years old. But that he loves you and that he's going to be there with you no matter what. And he, he changes hearts. He changes hearts. And who's to say he won't change people's hearts? You see it every day. And so, you know, I don't want to get, you know, on too much of a, a negative feel or anything like that. I think it's a fine line between, you know, understanding that it is real, uh, but that God's real too, and that he cares about us and he loves us. You know, I was thinking, you talk about change and uh, just trying to understand uh, these events that have taken place, uh, you know, among us, and uh, and just thinking about the fact that, you know, we we all have a way of looking at things. Uh, each one of us has a world view, and uh, and we, if I can say, we have some lens that we wear that determine what we see on the other side. And uh, I think most of us will, will agree that if you wear, you know, a pair of green uh, uh, glasses with, you know, green uh, lenses, everything that you see is going gonna, is gonna to look green. And, uh, and that's why sometimes, you know, you see this struggle, uh, people not maybe able to see what they need to see because of the lens. And so, you know, I just feel that it's, it's important that, you know, we are transformed in the way we think, you know, as a people. And, uh, you know, Paul says something in, in Romans chapter 12, a uh, very familiar passage, uh, verse 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And then he says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so uh, I, th I think there's a challenge, you know, before us to really be transformed uh, by the renewing of our minds. And that means that we are exposing ourselves to the truth of the word of God. We are exposing ourselves to the things that, you know, reveal the character of God. And it's not a one-time thing that we do. It is a continuous uh, process, daily um, allowing our minds to be transformed. And I think um, then we can begin to see uh, if it's racism, we are going to see it for what it is, and uh, if, if we are going to be able to take a stand against it. But it has to begin with the renewing of our minds. <clears throat> Dr. John Maxwell uh, says that maturity is when someone can see things from the other person's point of view, from their perspective. And immaturity is whenever they only see it from their point of view and how it affects, how it affects them. You know, Jonathan, your young man, Jackson, is fortunate that he has you, has you as a dad and a role model to look up to, to, to guide him, to answer the questions that he has. When a, a young infant and child is born into this um, world, he comes in like a blank sheet of paper. And he's totally selfish and totally dependent upon um, 
someone else to take care of him, provide for him. And if he's unhappy with his diaper or his, uh, uh, he's hungry, he lets everybody know. And he's, not, he's going to stay unhappy until somebody helps him. And this, uh, as he progresses and starts to grow, he becomes a product of his environment. Uh, those around him shape his values and his character and the things that are important. And then as he continues to, to grow farther, he looks to role models. He looks to people. That, to, who do I want to be like when I grow up? Who do I respect and admire? And there are good role models and there are not so good role models. So it's important that we, as imperfect as we are as, as men of God and, and professing Christians, that we set a good example and do the best we can to, to, to guide these youngsters that are coming up and following so we can pass the baton of faith on to them. With as these, it's not going to go away, but we got to help it and do the best we can to. So let me just throw out a question out there. Speaking of that maturity, where we can actually see from other people's perspective, if like to some of you guys on there, what's if you could say one thing that you would love to see someone grow and something that they could learn to start seeing things from your perspective or just from like just just to grow in, what would that one thing be? If we could just like, I mean, maybe we can't narrow it down to one, but maybe something personal. Like, man, if, we, if you could just understand this or if you could just see how this or what you say when you say this affects me or my family. Uh, can you think of anything like that? You know, as a person of color, you know, I would just really like to be able to have people see me uh, just as a human being. Uh, made in the image of God with uh, the same value as any other human being. Uh, I think the Bible is very clear in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 that God has made all men in his image. Both men and women have been made in the image of God. And so uh, if, if you look at somebody and you don't assign the value of a human to that person, you're pretty much uh, questioning the wisdom of God. And so, um, you know, personally, you know, one of the things I just really like to, you know, people to be able to see is that when you look at a human being, it doesn't matter how they look like, you're looking at a masterpiece of God Almighty. That's what uh, uh, Paul says in Ephesians. He says, we are his workmanship. And other translation says, we are a masterpiece. It means that when you look at me and look at everybody else that you see, you're seeing, at, you're seeing God's work and, and best work in that person. And so it's about seeing the value that God has assigned. And so that's one thing personally that I really would like to be able to see that, you know, we value one another as people that have been made in the image of God. And if we don't do that, we are pretty much questioning the wisdom of God. Um, if, I, I would answer your question this way, Pastor Micah. Um, as it deals with race relations, and, and we, we discussed this a, a little bit earlier, um, it's important that we start hearing. I think there's room for that no matter where you find yourself at with your convictions on, on all of this, whether you're white, black, Hispanic, or whatever. We have room to start listening. The Bible tells us to be what? Slow to speak, quick to hear. Uh, I know for me personally, uh, that's something that's been revealed to me through all of this is that I need to start hearing, start listening. In doing so, I have found myself in a position of empathy that I've not found myself uh, in before. I think I've sympathized with situations, but a position of empathy is when we're truly going to begin to learn about one another, learn who one another is. Yeah, I would I would echo that as well. It, it, it's listening um, with with the with the intent to have that empathy and to understand. But for me, uh, just because of how I I think it's it's listening because they want they need to get that out of them. If there's an anger, if there's a frustration, if there's a way that they feel, we need to hear that truth being spoken out. 
so many times I think what we, we tell people and what I've heard a lot of uh, that's come up in, in, in this, um, this season that we're in is like people will say, well, black lives matter. And I heard a pastor the other day say, I'm not talking about the movement. I'm talking about a black life that matters. And that really hit me different when I heard that. And, and, and he said, so, but what the response to that is, well, all lives matter. Well, no, right now, there's a black man that was killed, murdered. That life mattered. And when, we, when we're dismissive and just say, well, all lives matter, what we're saying is, shut up. I don't want to hear your truth. And I think the danger is when we start suppressing that truth, we get the results that we're getting right now. People want to be heard. As Pastor Thomas said at the beginning, we, want to, we need to listen to what's being said. And here's the thing that I believe with all my heart is that if we will listen to somebody get out their truth, and reveal it for what it is, ugly, whatever it is, let it get out. At that point, they now become a receiver of what God's word, the truth. You know, in the book of John chapter 8, it says, So Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, Believers, if you abide in my word and you are truly my disciples, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But we can't get there until we first abide with God's word, with who God is. And sometimes people can't get there until they get their truth out. And so when we get their truth, it's like, I, I don't, I'm not going to delegitimize your truth. It may be different from mine, but it's yours. But now here's my truth. And then we both agree to say, we got our truth out. Now what does God's truth have to say about that? And in that place of abiding in God's word, we're going to hear the truth, his truth, and be set free. But right now we, we're trying to suppress what's being spoken too often in society in general. And so we're suppressing that truth and eventually it's going to come out. And it's, not, it's going to come out in ways that we wish it would never have come out. But until we're willing to listen and hear and see what people are going through, what, what your experience is, what my experience is, and we get that out now, okay, now I've made a place for God's truth to come in and to change my heart, which is what you said earlier. It's got, about, it's got to be heart change. But that can't happen if we're suppressing truth. Can, can I touch on a little bit about the um, uh, scripture that you were quoting from Genesis, we're all made in God's image and likeness. Um, I have struggled mightily uh, in recent years um, uh, with the judgment spirit, with a particular sector of our um, um, culture. And very profoundly and uh, uh, distinctly, it's about nine months ago, maybe a year ago, God spoke to my spirit and said, you need to see them as I see them. Yes. And that's how we need to see one another. Not what you're wearing, not your skin color, not your economic status, not your social status, but we need to see each other as God sees us. Well, how does God see us? He sees us enough to forget how we've sinned against him. Yes and to never remember that anymore. He sees us as his family. He sees us as his sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. He sees us corporately as the church without a spot or wrinkle that he's sending his son back for. And we need to look upon each other that way. And it's in us to do so. Genesis 1, 26 says what? God made us in his image, and his likeness. So it's in us to do so. No, absolutely. What a role we as the church have, you know, to give voice to, you know, those facing injustices, those that are oppressed, you know. Um, you know, it, 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 so my grandfather in the uh, early 70s, uh, there was, he was city mayor of Lawrence, and there were several uh, pretty important things, uh, legislative pieces and uh, different things that he was able to pass as city commissioner. Uh, one of them was the Fair Housing Ordinance that obviously, uh, uh, you know, cut discrimination and, and, and people trying to buy and rent houses and stuff like that. It was, it was, it was beautiful. And then, um, you know, he, he uh, started the uh, funding for the city, the first public city pool here in Lawrence. Uh, that was open to everybody. There was a private pool in Lawrence, wasn't open to a certain group of people. They had to go, as he said it, they had to go swim in the river. And, you know, he told me, he, he said, you know, uh, Jonathan, uh, some of my biggest supporters 
were the pastors of the local churches. Some of my biggest opponents were pastors from the churches, you know? And what, what, what a role we have to empower, to give voice to, to elevate. It starts with us, people of God. And, and if it radiates from us, the way that we live our lives every single day, starting with that, and giving voice to and empowering, you know, we can change. We can change it, and we can give voice to. Well, and those stories give hope. They really do. We can't, we can't forget those stories. Um, a lot of times those stories are looked up on. I feel as if they're looked up on as if we're ignoring what's happening today. Uh, we're not, but they give hope. I can tell a similar story. My mom, I grew, my mom grew up in a town uh, where the black community had a separate swimming pool. What's well, it much bigger than this stage that we're on? The remnants of it is still there today. And I spent part of my childhood in that town, part of my adult life as well, and it's still there. So it's always a constant reminder to those of us who knew or who know what that remnants is. So it's important for us to remember that because it shows where we were at. It shows the path that we have taken since then and should give encouragement for the path that we've still yet to conquer, yes, sir. For, the, for the obstacles that we still have before us because here's the ones that we've overcome. And I think it's important to, to remember that. Um, you know, the Thurgood Marshalls and the Martin Luther Kings and the, the people who have uh, given their life and given their blood, sweat, and tears to advance this country in regards to civil rights. Um, it's important for us to remember that because that should give hope, that should give encouragement for us to move forward. So that story of your grandfather is a powerful story. Share that, um, not because it shows we have arrived, but it shows that we can overcome. It shows that the battles have been won mm -hmm. as we move through the war of racism. You know, thinking about the change that, you know, we all you know, pray for. And uh, I'll be honest, you know, and I think most of us may agree, you know, sometimes it just feels overwhelming when you think about the reality, you know, of what we are facing, and you think about the change that you'd like to see, sometimes you, you do feel overwhelmed. There's a little story that I think most of you know about, but this man is walking um, by the sea on the sand, and there are thousands of starfish that have been washed ashore by a storm, and they are lying on the sand. Thousands of them, uh, they're just dying because of the sun. And then uh, this man notices a little child who is uh, picking up a starfish and tossing it back into the ocean, one starfish. And when he got closer to her, he said, um, I'm sorry to say this, but why do you bother? Look, there are thousands and thousands of these starfish uh, on the sand. Why do you bother to pick up just one and toss it back in the ocean? So the child uh, was silent for a moment. She uh, uh, bent down, picked up one more starfish, tossed it back to the ocean, looked at the man, and she said, I made a difference to that one. I made a difference to that one. And so I feel that um, we have the potential to make a difference. And it might just be one person at a time, one day at a time, one step at a time. It's about all of us making a commitment and saying, I can make a difference. I can treat a person of color in a different way than I've done before. Might be my neighbor, maybe somebody on my job, maybe somebody at the church, but a step at a time, 
and we can make a difference. The, the book of John in chapter 15, uh, verse 12, Jesus is speaking and he says, it's about love and he says, uh, this is my command that we love one another as I've loved you. And the, the next verse, 13, says that uh, no greater love than for a man to lay down his life for another. And this is, <clears throat> love is a relationship. You have to spend time for a, in a love relationship to love somebody. You've got to be with them and spend time with them. They talk about long-distance love relationships don't work very well because you're not together. And it's, it's important that we're, we're together. Uh, and when I think about uh, marriages of, of uh, uh, long-term marriages, those who have been married 40 and 50 years, golden anniversaries and this sort of thing, I'm thinking that's a, it's not because there were not conflicts or problems in, in the marriage, but there was forgiveness. You know, people that have been married that long, there's a lot of forgiving, a lot of forgiving that makes that thing last that long to, to make it all work. That reminds me, uh, Steve, of a sermon series that Pastor had several months back, First Things First. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to kind of sum it up, the first thing first in our lives should be our relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. With that comes all the promises, all the benefits of, of uh, having Jesus as our, as our Lord and Savior. That first things first has really struck a chord uh, with with me. Um, I often go back to the uh, scriptures that were used during that during that series, and it oftentimes takes me to another scripture. I'm not I'm not sure if this scripture was used during that series or not, but it's First Corinthians chapter one verse eighteen. For those that are perishing, the finished work of the cross is foolishness. But to us who believe, mm -hmm. we know that it's the power of God. And first things first, Jesus has died for each and every one of us. And that relationship is the first thing that brings us back into the family. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that's going to put us in a position with God to where we can love our neighbors, mm -hmm. where we can see each other as the perfect creation's in, in Christ, right, uh, where we can still yet have hope because we know God loves us when we face racism, overt, in-your-face racism. So first things first, and we'll find ourselves in a position to love as the Bible says, love our neighbors as Christ loved the church, Right? Yeah, and, and Michael, speaking of first things first, you know, it just feels to me like we're in another Second Chronicles 7.14 moment. And, you know, we've been in a pandemic, and it just feels like in a lot of ways God's getting our attention on another level through this recent situation. And, you know, Second Chronicles 7.14, the promise is that God will heal our land. But the thing that comes first is, he says, if my people will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, seek my face. That's our part, and that has to happen first. And I think it's an opportunity to talk about an uncomfortable truth, and that is that racism has been embraced in some ways, and it has remained in hidden ways in the body of Christ and in the church. And I know I wanted to listen more than anything, but I do have a testimony about how I personally got my eyes open to the depth of how that had become ingrained even in the body of Christ. And it was about 2002, and I was a younger single man before I had met my beautiful wife, Amity. And there was a gentleman who was a leader in the church. And he came to me one day, and he said, Thomas, I have a word from God for you. And I said, well, let's hear it. And he said, I believe that you're supposed to marry. And he, he shared the name of a young lady who was the granddaughter of a prominent minister in Texas who our church had a relationship with. And he said, I believe you're supposed to, to marry this young lady. What a power couple you would be for God. And I was a young single guy. I was like, come on, let's go. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and, and so he came back to me, though, guys, a few days later. And this was before social media, before Facebook. I'm sure he had made a phone call or two. Because he had told me, he said, would you allow me to make an introduction? And I said, sure, you know. And so he came back to me a few days later, and this is what he said. He said, Thomas, I have to tell you, I miss God. I made a mistake. And what he had discovered when he had made the phone call was the last name of this young lady was a Hispanic name. 
She was part white, part Hispanic, and he looked me right in the eye, and he said, I miss God. Didn't have a word from God for you because God would never have told me to call you to marry anything less than a pure white girl. A leader in the church. And I looked right at him, and I said, that's the most evil thing I've ever heard anyone say. Open my eyes to the depth of how those, that evil of racism has become intertwined in our hearts. And I think the opportunity that we have as a church is saying, God, that's an obvious example of it. But what about the ways that maybe are not so obvious that have affected the way that I see my brother and my sister? How would I react when my son or daughter brought home a young man or a young woman of, the, of, the, of another race that they were interested in dating. How would that react? Are there some ways that maybe aren't so obvious that I need to say? The psalmist says, search me and know me, O oh God. And I just know that in this season, because of just the blatant display of evil that the George Floyd killing was, I just believe that there's an opportunity for us to just in a, neat, in a new and a deeper way, just say, God, search us and help us to be a part of the solution and let it start with me. Being willing to, to confront those places where maybe those things have been allowed to hide in the corners of my heart. So I guess, you know, what I would say, uh, Pastor Thomas, as far as what we as a church can do, um, we, and I think that you shared it, you know, we've got to call it, call it what it is. We've got to call it out. Um, and that's exactly what you did. You know, it, it, it's racism and, and it shouldn't be accepted uh, in the church, in the body of Christ. There's no room for it. And so, um, you know, th I think that's first and foremost. Obviously, we need to continue to uh, give voice and continue to empower people um, to be uh, uh, comfortable and confident to step out. And, and, you know, obviously there's other things. Obviously, you know, we need to continue to pray for, for each other. We need to, uh, you know, obviously continue uh, to, to pray that, um, you know, God continues to transform us, to continue to renew us and, you know, to make us more like him. And in, in his image, um, and I think that's extremely important. Um, but 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 once again, to, to speak out against injustice and to speak out against racism, not just in the church but in the community, um, you know, I, I think it's extremely important. And that's a you know that that's a step that that we can all take and that we all need to take. And within the last two hours, just uh, a thought that I just felt, you know, the Lord bring to. To my spirit was, you know, God, God wants to do some healing. Uh, God's heart in everything that we are saying and witnessing, God's heart is to bring healing. And uh, it doesn't please God to see, you know, the kind of things that we have seen. Uh, they've happened in the past, uh, happened recently, uh, and, and he wants to heal. I believe that you know, the church uh, needs to be at, you know, the forefront of, of what God wants to do. Because I think we, most of us believe that, you know, the church has answers to the things that plague the world. Um, and that does not exclude racism. Uh, the church is able to have an impact. And, uh, and I think, you know, we have a challenge as a church, and, and not just Ref City, but the body of Christ in general, uh, to really, uh, you know, step out you know, in faith and see how we can, you know, be a part of the healing, you know, that God wants to do. You know, as a minority, I can tell you there are many people that walk into a church on Sunday morning and they don't feel fully accepted. And sometimes uh, the experience that they have, and I've experienced this myself uh, in certain areas, is not very different from what they experience outside the walls of the church. And I think um, the challenge is for, for the church to be able to be different from the world and therefore be a part of the plan of God to bring healing. You know, God's standards are high. God has raised the bar in terms of how we relate to one another, but he has also given us the grace to be able to do it. So if we fail, it is not because the grace wasn't there. Uh, it is because, you know, we did not do what he wanted us to do. Um, 
you know, John says something uh, in First John uh, chapter 4. He says, we love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And so, uh, you know, my, my prayer is, you know, is that we can be willing to participate uh, in the healing, you know, that God wants to bring uh, by, you know, uh, coming up to meet the standard that God has set to love one another, you know, as he has loved us. And so much like in society becomes a, a, um, a balance, as you're talking about love, and I agree with everything that, that you said, but God has, has given us a warrior spirit as well. And sometimes we have to, we have to wake up that warrior spirit. And I think that's where the church is right now. Mm-hmm. We've got to wake up that spirit and be prepared to battle, not against our fellow man, but against the enemy. Yes, sir. Pastor, you talked about how big is the Goliath in, the, in, in your opening. This is the church's Goliath. Yes, sir. And we've got to stand up like David stood and call him out. Yes, sir. David challenged him. And I'll paraphrase, basically he said, who do you think you are? That's what he said to him. And we've got to stand up and call this what it is, Jonathan, just like you said. But we've got to challenge it, and we've got to say, who do you think you are? Well, let me show you who I am. James in 4.7 says, submit yourself to God and resist the devil. We need to bring up a resistance and he will flee, is what the scripture says. So the church is finding itself in this position. I'm finding myself in this position to where it's time to wake up that warrior spirit. And it's important that we don't wake that up man against man. That's right. Jesus looked at Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. He wasn't talking to the man right? He was talking to that spirit that was operating through him. And that's what we're facing here. Not our fellow brother, white, black, blue, green, purple, whatever. We're facing the enemy. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, occupy. And we've got to occupy. Occupy till I come. And that means sometimes we have to be prepared to battle. It takes me to Ephesians 11. It's a spiritual battle. And that's where I see the church is. That's where our challenge is today. We're facing a great Goliath. And we need to have the courage of David. Yeah, so well said. And, um, you know, remaining silent just hasn't worked. And we've got to, the church has to discover our voice to speak into these issues. Because, listen, we cannot wait on a political party or an election. We need to do those things. There are some things maybe that... We can legislate, but only the Holy Spirit of God can change the heart of man. Only the Holy Spirit and only the cross of Jesus Christ can really lead us to the forgiveness that needs to be extended one to another and to the justice and the restoration that needs to happen in our churches, in our homes, in our hearts, and in our nation. So I want to say thank you for being a part of this conversation today. And we're going to continue it next Sunday. We're going to continue this conversation, maybe even go deeper, but... I felt impressed by the Lord for us as we close today to lead our church family and to unite together and to receive communion together and remind ourselves that it's the blood of Jesus that unites us. In God's economy, come on, every tribe, every nation, every tongue is going to gather around the throne of Jesus. God doesn't see color. He created every person, every person, black, white, brown, yellow in between, is uniquely and perfectly created in the image of God. And there's no room for racism in the body of Christ. And we're going to take and we're going to hold this cup and this bread in our hands and we're going to consume it today reminding ourselves that this unifies us as one body and it unifies us as one family. So let's take this together today, men and church family, friends, wherever you are right now, if you want to just 
you haven't already had the chance to just grab whatever you have on hand, just something to put in your hand. Come on, I really believe it's not about what you have in your hand. It's just about the posture of your heart, just remembering. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, my sacrifice, my shed blood, the, the price I paid to forgive and remove your sins from you. So let's receive this together. Right there where you are, would you join with us? If you don't have access to something, would you just turn your heart towards God? And Boniface, would you take the bread and would you pray over it and bless it and lead our church family in receiving it today? John, would you take the cup and pray over it and bless it and lead our congregation, our church family in receiving it together today? Father, we just want to uh, just thank you for the sacrifice of, of Jesus on the cross. Lord, we had a debt that we couldn't pay. You came and you offered the very best so that we could be reconciled to you. We thank you, uh, Jesus, that your, your death reconciled us to the Father. We are no longer separated. We have been reconciled. Thank you that every wall has been broken and you have built a bridge so that we can come to you and we can be reconciled to one another. So thank you, uh, Jesus, for this sacrifice and for your body that was broken for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. And Father, we come to you and we thank you. We thank you for this cup, Father. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your renewal of our hearts, of our minds, God. We ask that you, you break these chains of, of racism, of, of injustice, Father. We ask that you come into our hearts, God, and just remove anything, Father, that is not pleasing to you, God, in, in this congregation, in each and every one of us, in our homes, Father. We ask that you just come in and just touch us, God. Just touch us and just transform us. We thank you, Father. We thank you for your shed blood, your forgiveness, uh, God, that we can come to you. And, and we're your sons and daughters, God, and you're gonna put your arms around us and you're gonna love us, God. And we ask that you just take away the hate, anything, God, that's keeping us from loving each other and loving you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what a powerful moment and powerful reminder. And thank you, men, for leading us and leading our church family. And I want to ask my brothers to stand alongside me as we close this time today. And as we pray for our church family, pray for our nation. I'm going to pray over us corporately, but right where you are today, right in your home, right in your office, right in your car, I want to invite you to pray. We need Jesus. Our nation needs Jesus. The only way to healing and the only way to reconciliation, the only pathway to restoration is more of Jesus in our hearts, our hearts turning and changing and being healed, being made soft. And so, Lord, we pray. We thank you, God, that you, you did send your son to make a way to pay the price we could not pay. We thank you, Lord, that we, we, we don't know what to do in the places where we're hurting, in the places where we're angry, in the places where we're confused, in the places where there's doubt, Lord, in the places where there's fear. Help us, Lord. Grace us today, God, individually and corporately and as a church, God, to do what only we know to do, Lord, in those moments, to look to you. We look to you. We cry out to you, Lord, on behalf of our church, on behalf of those hearts that are hurting, Lord, on behalf of those hearts that are angry, God. We look to you. We lift them up before you, God. And we pray, Lord, that you would come and do what only you can do, God. Bring healing to our land as we, as your people, turn and repent and, and, and humble ourselves and look to you, Lord Jesus. I just pray over this church. I pray over every man, a woman, and young person, Lord. I just pray that you would comfort hearts and bring strength and bring hope, Lord. Bring fresh faith, Lord, in a way that only you can do. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. And lastly, and most importantly, we want to give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus Christ. 
If you're far from God, and maybe you once knew God and once served God, maybe you grew up in the Christian church, but you today you find yourself, you've drifted, your heart is far from him. And we believe if that's you, or maybe you've never given your life to Jesus Christ and received this amazing free gift of salvation through the cross of Jesus Christ, we want to pray with you. And we do this together, men. We do this together, church family, every week for a couple of reasons. And one is because we want to quickly just affirm to those who are making this dedication and making this commitment that we want to come alongside you and stand with you and encourage you as you begin your new faith in Jesus Christ. And two, we do this because even as we're growing in our faith, we recognize, we realize that we never graduate from grace. We need the grace of God in our life as much today as we ever have. So come on, if that's you, respond in your heart and repeat after me. Father, in Jesus' name, we recognize our need for a Savior. And we thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price we could never pay, to make a way that we might have new lives and a fresh start. We give you our lives. We give you our trust. And because of Jesus, come on, because of the cross of Jesus, I'll never be the same. We will never be the same. Thank you, Lord, right there where you are. Come on, let's rejoice with all of heaven for the precious people who gave their lives to Jesus today. And for what he's doing in our hearts, for the healing, and for the restoration that he's bringing to our hearts and to our homes and to our nation. Listen, friend, if that was you, you dedicated your life to Jesus, we would love to hear from you. Would you text us? We have a gift. We would love to send you some resources we want to put in your hand. Text new life, all one word, to the text number 30500, or you can email us at newlife at revcity.com. Well, we love you. We're praying for you. Come on, let's join together as we turn to God and let's worship him together one more time today.